Tonight's speaker has been a longtime member of the Chicago Civil Roundtable. He is formerly from the South Side. Uh, now he's migrated to the West Side, West Western Suburbs. Uh, John Horn has been practicing law since 1976. Uh, he has previously written three books and co-edited another uh, about Petersburg, Virginia soldiers and the siege of that city. His most recent book is The Petersburg Regiment in the Civil War, A History of the 12th Virginia Infantry from John Brown's Hanging to Appomattox, 1859 to 1861. It won the 2019 Army Historical Foundation Distinguished Writing Award for Unit History. It's quite an award. Um, John has also published articles in the Civil War Times, America's Civil War, Gettysburg Magazine, North and South Magazine, and Emerging Civil War. He also has a webpage that he blogs in as well. His current book is Grant Lay's Siege to Lee, Petersburg, June 18, July 1st, 1864. This book is due out from in, uh, in the spring of 2025. Right? Without further ado, Mr. John Moore. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis, and thank you all for having me. I have a preliminary uh, a preliminary announcement to make. I brought a few of books. The uh, the two books I brought with me are the Petersburg Regiment and the Battles for the Weldon Railroad, August 1864. In a way, the the uh, the August 1864 book is a sequel to the book I'm writing now. But anyway, the important thing about the books that I brought is I've dedicated the profits from the sales of my books in 2024 to the medical bills of my fellow author, Eric Wittenberg. So these books are for sale for $20 a piece. You want one of the books, there's a can back there. You can toss 20 bucks into the, the can and grab a book. I'll be happy to inscribe it later. <clears throat> now I'm gonna start fairly slowly here because on the Wilson Couts Ray, because it's gonna be hard for you to see the locations on the map. I'm gonna try and highlight them the best I can with the, the laser pointer. <clears throat> For example, we have Petersburg over here. And I'll try to give you an idea of the movements that are taking place, largely with the pointer. The, yes, and then at the end of the presentation, I'm briefly going to compare this operation, the Wilson Couch raid, with another raid in the east and perhaps a raid or two in the west, but briefly. <clears throat> the situation at the start of the Wilson Couch raid, which lasted from June 22nd, 1864 until July 1st, 1864, was that the federal and Confederate armies having fought their way down to Cold Harbor, the Army of Northern Virginia on the Confederate side and the Army of the Potomac on the federal side, General Grant decided to cross the James River and attempt to seize Petersburg by what's called a coup de main. In other words, say, just simply seizing it with, with the thought that there were not enough defenders there to stop it. <laughs> he failed. He, he succeeded in crossing 
the James in such a way as to fool General Lee for a while, but he failed to seize the city of Petersburg. Several days of, of assaults followed. In fact, thank you. Assaults continued, went on from the 15th to the 18th of June. And ultimately they failed. They were against the eastern side of Petersburg. General Grant bounced back immediately yes. from this failure to seize the city. In fact, on the night of the 18th, he was talking to one of his aides about his plans to proceed against the Confederates at that point. He mentioned to Horace Porter, who was one of his aides, that his intent was to send infantry a narrow on a narrow uh, route around the city. He held the city. He held the lines of Petersburg uh, on the eastern side of the city, on the Appomattox below. Appomattox River below the city to approximately the Jerusalem Plank Road, which ran, ran pretty closely to north and south from the city. And he, in, he intended to advance by stages from Petersburg to the Weldon Railroad. The Weldon Railroad ran in like this to the south, and it connected Petersburg with the Deep South and with the port of Wilmington, Delaware, which was a very important port. After Grant succeeded in extending his lines westward to the Weldon Railroad from Jerusalem Plank Road, which was of a, a distance of about three miles. He intended to use another corps to extend from the Weldon Railroad to the Appomattox River above the city, which would cut the what's called the South Side Railroad, which ran more or less westward from Petersburg. As it turned out, well, he didn't under, he didn't realize what this would do to the Confederates fully in the sense that when he finally got to the uh, Appomattox River above the city, it was April 2nd, 1865. That's how long it took him to get there. And when he got there, the Confederates realized that it was time to leave. It only they they lasted one week fur, further, and they were forced to surrender at Appomattox. But be that as it may, General Grant intended to to in what is called invest the city of Petersburg. That means to form lines outside it from the uh, Jerusalem Plank Road to the. Appomattox above the city, cutting off the Weldon <clears throat> and the South Side Railroads. Outside the narrow lines that the Federal Infantry would form, he intended to send cavalry raiders to destroy the railroads south of the city. There were two purposes there. One was to destroy the Confederate supply lines. The other was to prevent Confederate reinforcements from getting from detraining too close to the to the places occupied by the Federals. And his idea was to send a cavalry raid to destroy the junction here. The junction was known as Burkeville, and 
That was the intent. That was the primary goal of the Wilson Counts raid. The participants in the raid, the first one was, well, the commander was James Harrison Wilson, who was an Illinois, a fellow of Illinois. And he had served on Grant's staff earlier in the war. After that, he went to the cavalry school, and there he encountered August Kautz, who was a, a German born in um, Baden-Württemberg. And Kautz had emigrated to the United States earlier. He had served as the colonel of the 2nd Ohio Cavalry, which was part of Wilson's, Wilson's division. Wilson had left the cavalry school at the beginning of the 1864 campaign and took command of a division of cavalry, the third, the third cavalry division of the Army of the Potomac. Kautz commanded the cavalry division of the Army of the James. That was Butler's army that conducted the Bermuda 100 campaign. And during the Bermuda 100 campaign, Kautz had led his division on two cavalry raids south of the Appomattox River. It was thought that his familiarity, such as it was, with the landscape would, would assist the raid. And it turned out that it did. Now, one of their opponents was William Henry Fitzhugh Lee, also known as Rooney Lee, one of General Robert E. Lee's sons. Rooney Lee was a major general, and he doesn't get a lot of attention, but on this raid, he was formidable. But the most formidable Confederate during the raid and indeed, during the whole second offensive, was Rufus Clay Berenger, who was a lawyer who commanded a brigade of North Carolina cavalry. The raid began on the 22nd, but on the 21st, let's go back to the map here. Well, it's a little bit it's a little bit big in scale to, to, to describe uh, Bear, Behringer's action. Okay, so here's Petersburg. Down here is Globe Tavern. This is where Behringer's Brigade of Cavalry was stationed. The Federal Second Corps on the 21st of June started its movement towards the Weldon Railroad. And, but of course it was utterly unfamiliar with the landscape. And it started moving westward and sort of northwestward towards the railroad. Behringer's brigade stopped this federal division from reaching the Weldon Railroad. And if you read Fox's numbers and losses in the American Civil War, you'll see, I, th I think it was, I think it was Fox. He thought that the division that Behringer stopped was the toughest division in the Union Army. So Behringer was already, Behringer's men were already tired when, when the, uh, the, the, the cavalry raid began, the Wilson Cowles raid began. But Behringer had already distinguished himself because the, the failure of the Second Corps to reach the Weldon Railroad on the 21st of June augured very poorly for this operation, for the, the, the operation that General Grant had set in motion. 
on the night of the 21st, Andrew A. Humphreys briefed General Wilson about what was expected of him and what he could expect. The goal was to destroy the junction and it was expected that General Wilson would lead his men through Globe Tavern, Sutherland Station, down here, and then to the junction and destroy it. Destroying as much track as they could along the way as well. Then there would be a number of options available to Wilson. First, he could proceed along the South Side Railroad to High Bridge and destroy High Bridge. Well, destroying High Bridge would have put a real crimp in the, the supplies that the Confederates got along the South Side Railroad because it would have been difficult to replace that bridge. farther along this way out there was Lynchburg. If if he exercise if Wilson exercised that option, he was encouraged to join Hunter, General David Hunter, who was proceeding, who was known to have been proceeding towards uh, Lynchburg, which was a huge Confederate supply dump. The only problem was that Hunter was already in retreat. The, during the James Crossing, General Grant had unleashed two divisions of cavalry under Philip Sheridan to tear up the Richmond and, not the Richmond, the uh, Virginia Central, which ran basically off the map here, but ran towards uh, the Shenandoah Valley. And the, um, but, but the Confederate cavalry under Wade Hampton had managed to stop, to stop uh, Sheridan from proceeding beyond Trevilian Station. It was hoped that Sheridan would also be able to join forces with Hunter and proceed but that didn't happen. Now, there were, uh, the other option was for Wilson to proceed down towards St Stanton River Bridge and destroy that. And that would be similar to the destruction of High Bridge. Destroying a bridge on one of the Confederate railroads would have been a big... Uh, uh, problem for them to overcome it because their their industrial capacity just wasn't the same as the, the Union uh, and their engineering capacity wasn't quite the same. It was more than one thinks, but it was not quite the same. And then depending if he if Wilson succeeded in destroying Staten River Bridge, the idea was he would proceed down to Georgia and join up with General Sherman. <clears throat> but if he didn't succeed, then he then he would have two other alt two other alternatives. One would be to proceed down to North Carolina because there were ports along the North Carolina coast, such as New Bern. And the other alternative was to come back to the Army of the Potomac. Now, as this briefing occurred, it was in the evening. And since the morning, oh, and, and Humphreys promised Wilson that if he tried to get back to the Army of the Potomac, he could count on two things. One, that the Federal Infantry would, would cover or, or cut off, basically, 
the Confederates from issuing from Petersburg to harass him. The, the Federal infantry was guaranteed to uh, cover the uh, works of Petersburg from Jerusalem, from the Appomattox River below the city to the Appomattox River above. So that the Confederates could not issue from Petersburg to attack Wilson as he returned to the Army of the Potomac. And Humphreys indicated to Wilson that even if the Federal infantry didn't manage to do this, General Sheridan's cavalry would be coming back from the Tervillian raid, and it would be able to cross the James and Appomattox at Deep Bottom and Point of Rocks by Pontoon Bridge and keep General Hampton's Confederate cavalry off Wilson's back. The only problem was <clears throat> Humphrey said known or should have known since that morning that Sheridan was not going to be able to cross by Pontoon Bridge because the federal the Confederates were blocking his way. And he would have to cross the James River about 10 miles downstream where Grant's army had originally crossed. And he would, and Sheridan would have to cross by boat, which would, took far, far longer than crossing by pontoon bridge. Likewise, even worse, Humphreys by that afternoon certainly knew that, that the federal infantry was not going was not having a, a good time trying to cover the southern approaches to Petersburg because General Barringer's cavalry brigade had turned back the lead division of the Federal Second Corps. And Rather than try to reach the Weldon Railroad, it was, the Second Corps was forming up to occupy perhaps a mile or two of uh, trenches to the, to the west of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem Plank Road and the Weldon Railroad. And it was looked for the, the Sixth Corps to join the Second Corps and extend the line to the Weldon Railroad. So Humphreys knew that the initial move toward the Weldon Railroad had not succeeded. But he gave Wilson a rosy scenario that, so that Wilson could expect he was going to march right back to the Army of the Potomac if he wanted to without any Confederate interference. With that, the raid started on the following day. <clears throat> the raiders began at uh, Prince George Courthouse to the east of Petersburg and started down towards Jerusalem Plank Road. They were heading in the direction of Globe Tavern, but they encountered Confederate pickets. And General Coutts made one of the critical decisions of the raid, which was we're not going anywhere near Globe Tavern. We're going to go around it down to Ream Station because if they had gone to Globe Tavern, they'd have run into Barringer's Brigade, fought a battle, and encumbered themselves with so many wounded that the raid would have ended before it began. So Couts exercised his discretion and led the column down to Ream Station, about which is 10 or 12 miles south of Petersburg. The Rudy Lee's division formed up and followed. There was a small fight at Ream Station, a few casualties, and then, then the, the two forces headed westward to Dinwiddie Courthouse. There were skirmishes along the way, 
the Confederates lost about seven men, the Federals, many of which were in inexperienced units, lost more than seven. The from Dinwiddie Courthouse, the Federals went up to Ford Station with, with the Confederates in pursuit. <clears throat> And at Ford Station, they began to rip up the South Side Railroad. There's South Side running this way. Wilson Station isn't named after General Wilson. There was a Wilson in the neighborhood. It's a common name, of course. <clears throat> Ripping up a railroad is difficult for cavalry because cavalry's on the move. Yes, they ripped up the railroad. The railroad, by the way, could have T or U rails. They're similar, similar but not exactly like our current rails. Sometimes a whole regiment of men would pick up the ties, turn turn the rails over, <clears throat> but that that involved a, a, a considerable amount of work. And these were some of the hottest days of the year. At around Fort Station, the Federals encountered a couple of trains and destroyed a couple, at least a couple of locomotives and, and a few cars. And they ripped up some rails around there. And with that, they bedded down for the night about one in the morning. And they, they, but they only spent a couple of hours sleeping. They were on the road again. This time, yes, and, and Counts was still in the lead on the following day. That day, Counts. Counts proceeded without interruption all the way to Bergfeld. That was the objective, the main objective. And he got to Bergfeld and started destroying things and tearing up the rails in each direction from, from <coughs> that. <coughs> Meanwhile, <coughs> Wilson followed the road and Rooney Lee's division got the benefit of a shortcut that a scout knew about. So that Rooney Lee arrived at a place known as the Grove at the same time as Wilson did. It was along the railroad, so Lee's division arrived on the eastern side of the rail cut as Wilson's division was coming up from the south to the same cut. Leading Lee, uh, Rooney Lee's division was James Deering's brigade of cavalry. It was basically the cavalry of the Department of North Carolina and Southern Virginia. It was about 800 men. <clears throat> Whereas leading Wilson's division was Chapman's brigade in Wilson's division, about 2,000 men. We, we'll come back to that picture. The Battle of the Grove took place along the railroad come here. And Yes, here's the railroad. And it took place along this cut. Deering was a bold officer, and he threw his 800 men against Chapman's 2,000. And eventually, numbers started to tell. Meanwhile, two batteries of horse artillery had unnumbered. And Chapman's counterattack captured those two batteries of, of horse artillery. Fortunately for 
the Confederates, it was then that Beringer's Brigade came up and launched attacks that drove back the Federals from the captured Confederate guns and stabilized the situation. <clears throat> the, the battle then developed into a, with the numbers more equal, the battle developed into a stalemate along the, along the railroad cut. Wilson eventually reinforced Chapman's brigade with a uh, unit from his other brigade under McIntosh, and, uh, and a, a Confederate attempt <clears throat> to outflank the Federals failed around seven in the evening. On the next day, Wilson backed away from the confrontation at the Grove and he proceeded toward the Richmond and Danville. Coutts was already engaged in wrecking the Wilson and Danville. He'd been contacted with, by Wilson through a staff officer who indicated the path he was to take. And we'll go back here. And here's one of our few illustrations. It's of the Federal Cavalry destroying General Lee's uh, communications, his railroads to South Petersburg. The, they continued ripping up the railroad all the way down to Keysville that day. So Cout started there, and <clears throat> at Meharan Station, Wilson joined him. The Federals made it down to Keysville that day. The Deering's Brigade rested. Berenger con continued his pursuit. The um, one of the batteries of Confederate artillery went back to Petersburg. The Richmond and Danville was a different kind of railroad than the South Side Railroad or the Weldon Railroad. The South Side, the Richmond and Danville had what are called strap rails. And these were wooden bases covered by a strap of, of metal. And they were very easy to, stroke, to destroy, too easy in a way, because you could, you could leave lighted brands next to, the, next to the rails and they'd catch fire and, and, and burn. And then it warped the, the strap and it would it would destroy the the uh, the wooden part of the rail, but it, it it wasn't like tearing up the railroad and and digging or a trench across it. It was a superficial destruction. On the 25th, the 25th was, in, in a way, one of the climaxes of the raid. From Keysville, the Federals proceeded down to Roanoke Station and Staten River Bridge with Beringer's Brigade in pursuit. All along the way, the Federals were sending out parties to get every horse they could because the, this raid was using up <laughs> horse flesh at a prodigious rate. And the Federals, when they would, when their horses would be too tired, they would kill the horse. <laughs> 
They would shoot the horse rather than let the horse go free and be gathered up by the Confederates. And they used so many bullets doing this, they gradually start, began to stop and slash the throats of the horses rather than shoot them. So the climax of the fighting, well, of the raid part, um, took place at uh, Stock River Bridge. It's probably hard for you to see the units here, but Houts's division drew the duty of attacking and destroying Stanton River Bridge. The only problem is there were about a thousand Confederates dug in there with 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 about a half a dozen cannon on the far side of the uh, far side of the river. And the Federals had to attack through a <clears throat> a marsh in a terribly hot day. I mean these these the days these days of the raid were in excess of 100 degrees. Meanwhile, Wilson wisely <clears throat> kept a brigade in reserve and he posed the position of brigade in his rear. And that was a smart move too because Berenger showed up to pressure Wilson's rear. And it took him, it took Berenger a while to arrive, but when he did, it, it made it clear to Wilson that it was time to, to move on, that there, he was not going to succeed in destroying that bridge, which would have been a, a serious blow to the Confederate supply network. Wilson studied his maps and decided he was going to return to the Army of the Potomac. The next day, he covered the ground from, oh, sorry, covered the ground from Staten River Bridge to Greensboro. On the 27th, his men proceeded to Sturgeonville. Already they were hearing rumors that they were headed into a trap. There was an action, there was a fight along the way that day, maybe, maybe a dozen casualties on each side. And then on the 28th, the federal, the raiders, the returning raiders crossed the Nataway River at the double bridges and proceeded and decided they, they conferred about which way to get back to Petersburg. <clears throat> Wilson wanted to proceed along the route that led towards Prince George Courthouse, which was just east just east of Petersburg. <clears throat> Counts thought that it would be better to proceed through Reams Station here. And they, they were both sleep addicts. They were both sleep deprived. And they were confused about which way they were going. They reached a misunderstanding and one thought he was going one, one uh, Couch thought Wilson was going one way when it turned out he decided to go another. But anyway, they went towards Saponi Church and Stony Creek Station here. Stony Creek and Saponi Church. And at Saponi Church, they encountered Confederates. Confederate cavalry. Wade Hampton's cavalry. The cavalry that Sheridan was supposed to take care of. The ground at Saponi Church was suited for defense. There were two cricks that 
to find the battlefield, it was going to be practically impossible for Wilson to break through there. They 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 retained ideas that they were going to bust through Hampton's line, but that that wasn't going to happen. The Wilson brought up artillery, and so did Hampton. <clears throat> and the the artillery that Hampton brought up, he brought up Graham's battery, which had been at the Grove, gone back to Petersburg, refurbished, and and then proceeded along with Hampton. And at Saponi Church, Hampton's forces stopped Wilson. So Wilson had to decide what to do. In the evening, <clears throat> he, he determined that he would back off and try to go to Reams Station because he had learned from contrabands, in other words, another word for slaves, that uh, there was federal infantry at Reams Station. So Wilson deployed Chapman's brigade back from McIntosh's line and prepared to withdraw McIntosh and Council's division, which isn't on the map here, and proceed northward to Reams Station. There's Wade Hampton, who was who was in the process of establishing himself as one of the main defensive bulwarks of Petersburg. He would be uh, as long as he remained in in uh, Virginia, which was till the following February or so. <clears throat> the the fact that the Raiders, the returning Raiders met Hampton's forces indicate the, the movements that were taking place that Wilson didn't know anything about. Fitz, Fitzhugh Lee's division of cavalry was coming down from the north side of the Janus. Sheridan was poking along as he crossed by, by boat, crossed the James by boat. The Army of the Potomac was supposed to, was occupying a line like this. It had been supposed to occupy a line that would extend to the uh, Appomattox River above Petersburg, but they didn't make it. General Mahone had routed the entire Second Corps with three, brig with three brigades of his own division. He routed three divisions of the Second Corps captured 1,700 prisoners and took taken four guns, which something which was something that the Second Corps had never experienced. And on the following day, June 23rd, he stymied the Sixth Corps and seized 600 Vermonters from the Sixth Corps, embarrassing them. <clears throat> the Let's see. Hampton's division had come down and occupied Saponi Church. All the while, Wilson and Couts were proceeding towards Saponi Church, followed by Behringer's, Behringer's Brigade and Rooney Lee's division. So these were the movements that were, had been taking place unknown to Wilson in the days before he encountered Hampton's cavalry at Saponi Church. On the following morning, after, after Wilson's men had left Saponi Church, except for Chapman's brigade, A picked force of 100 men outflanked the 
federal exponent church. And then as the other Confederates executed frontal attacks, rolled up their lines. They rolled up the first Vermont, the eighth New York, the third Indiana, the 22nd New York. They smashed those units, routed them. And they scattered to the four winds. Chapman, the commander, did his best to gather uh, up and rally his men. He collected 300 men and led them up towards Ream Station. Hampton, Hampton's men remained here to gather up the spoils of war from the battlefield, lots of guns and, and ammunition. This was on the 29th, the morning of the 29th of June, 1864, the day after the fight, uh, the day after the fight at Saponi Church began. It lasted overnight, all night. Now another fellow entered the fray, William Mahone, who had just routed the Second Corps and embarrassed the Sixth Corps, the federal two federal corps. He'd inflicted about uh, 3,000 casualties on the, the uh, Federals at a cost of perhaps 1,000 to the Confederate side. <clears throat> he was a former railroad president of the Norfolk and Petersburg Regiment, and he's famous for saying, I knew every inch of the ground around Petersburg because he'd surveyed it all. So he could find a way to move along a ravine and pop up behind the Federals where they were never they would never expect it. On the morning of the 29th, the Federals started to arrive at Ream Station, which is yeah, okay, right around here. They had been they came down the Weldon Railroad from Virginia. The Confederate, the Federals later would act as if these two brigades of uh, Confederates, the, the Alabama Brigade and the Florida Brigade, were 2,000 men. If they were 1,000 men, I, I'll be surprised because they'd both been active in the fighting of the previous week. And, and to, to march in that kind of weather, our unit just bled straight acres. So, but Counts', Counts men came up and, and fought with the uh, the federal or the Confederate uh, infantry, and it did so credibly. They captured a few uh, prisoners from the Alabama Brigade, but the Confederates were able to stop them, and the column of Federals started to back up. The Brigade of West, the, the ambulances and trains, and the when I, when I refer to trains, of course, I'm talking about wagon trains. And then McIntosh's brigade back there, and up from up from Saponi Church would soon be coming the remnant of Chapman's brigade, about 300 men. So Wilson and Kyle's had to decide what to do. And they conferred about it. And while they were conferring, Fitzhugh Lee's division of cavalry show, showed up and began in, insinuating itself beyond the left of the Federals. And it, it, it and Mahone's men attacked in the early afternoon. Mahone's men Mahomes infantry went straight westward, but units of Fitzhugh Lee's division outflanked the Federals and broke into the, mid, the midst of the Federals. They eventually reached the ambulances and trains. They split up the Federals so that Couch's men tried to break, actually succeeded in breaking out this to the south and east. Whereas Wilson's men attempted to break out to the 
west to the southwest, a much which would involve a much longer route back to safety. <laughs> when the uh, it it took Kautz's men only till the evening to get back to federal lines. They went uh, they went this way and then eastward and then northward. Whereas the Wilson, it took several days for Wilson get, to get back because he had to go southward all the way to the Nataway River, cross it, and then he went south east to Jarrett Station, which was about 30, 35, 40 miles south of Petersburg. And it took him till July 1st to return to federal lines. And they looked uh, worn out because they had flocks of contrabands with them, perhaps a thousand or two. The Confederates would have done more damage to Wilson's column if Fitzhugh Lee, who was, this is a different Fitzhugh Lee, this is Fitzhugh Lee, not, not uh, Rooney Lee. And Rooney Lee was General Lee's son. Fitzhugh Lee was General Lee's nephew. And there seems to have been a rivalry between him and Hampton. At the time, Hampton was ad hoc commander of the Confederate cavalry, but not officially. And Fitzhugh Lee neglected to apprise General Hampton of what was going on at, at Reen Station, because if he had told Hampton that General, that uh, Wilson was retreating in the direction that he retreated, Hampton would have been able to block him at, at Jarrett Station and probably inflict 500 to 1,000 more casualties on the Federals. <clears throat> the, the raid ended in ignominiously a uh, disaster, and it, it uh, bothered Wilson for the rest of his life. The total federal loss was, I count, 1521. The Confederates lost 357. The reason was that the Confederates would get some rest once in a while. The Federals were always fighting. They might get, they might get a couple of hours rest. At Reem Station, where they yielded perhaps a thousand prisoners, they were falling asleep on the firing line. The, the Confederates brought to bear more than 10,000 men against the 5,500 of Wilson's division. They didn't always feel, or they didn't ever feel 10,000 men at once, but 10,000 men came 10,000 Confederates came in contact with Wilson's 5,500 and gradually wore them down. And the Confederates fought more effectively more effectively than, than the Federals uh, by a difference of 1.22 to 0 0.54, or, or using another way of measuring effectiveness, 147 to 65. So more than twice as effective. They were fighting at, a, at a, an effectiveness of more than twice as the Federals. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to briefly compare this raid to Trevelyan Station. Pavilion Station, the main objective of the raid was successful. The, the idea was to divert Lee's attention from the James River crossing, and, and Sheridan's force succeeded in doing it. 
Likewise, even even though Hampton defeated him in his move towards Lynchburg, likewise, Wilson succeeded in destroying Burtville Junction, even though he didn't succeed in much else. In the Western Railroad, in the Western Theater, General Sherman eventually decided to move toward Atlanta with his infantry because he he launched enough cavalry raids that had been complete that had been ineffective because cavalry just isn't very good at tearing up railroads whereas infantry plots itself plops itself across the railroad line digs it up digs a trench across it uses the the um, the ties to create fires and uses the fires to bend the rails out of shape. And when Grant went back to the uh, Weldon Railroad, the, he used infantry for because he, he'd already had to send most of his cavalry to the Shenandoah Valley when he, by the time in August when he attacked the Weldon Railroad. And that's what the Federals did. They dug a trench across the rail, the rail bed. They took up the ties. They burned the ties. They used the the uh, the, bur the fires to heat and bend the rails. And that's the you've got to. Uh, they learned that Sher Sherman and Grant both learned that they had to use infantry if they wanted to run the rails. So that's really the. The bottom line on the the Wilson and Coutts raid that it should have been a learning experience for General Grant anyway, and uh, it, if it, if it, if he didn't learn from it and used the the Federal infantry to to, to cut the Weldon Railroad, so much the better. Um, if he it, it probably was a necessity. The the one thing Wilson after the war. Listen to a Confederate general say, well, it was the, oh, your raid was the most terrible thing that happened in Confederacy. And, and he, uh, Wilson chose to believe him. But the fact is, the, 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 the fact is, the Southside Railroad was running a week after that Wilson got finished with it because the, the damage had been superficial. Uh, according to this Confederate general after the war, the Richmond and Danville had been torn up for apparently since till the 27th of August, but it was it was carrying passengers by the 9th of August. In fact, General Lee ran a a disinformation campaign about his railroads. He did. He told the newspapers he keep telling them how bad the railroads have been damaged. We don't want them attacking the railroads again. And he fooled the Confederate, uh, the Federals significantly. So I hope I've added to your knowledge of the Wilson and Coutts raid. And uh, thanks for being so patient with me. John will take questions now. If you have any questions for John about right. the presentation tonight? Far away. Yes, sir. So, John, was that the largest cal Union cavalry raid of the Petersburg campaign then, between June and the following April? Well, if, if you exclude following April, when General General uh, Sheridan had three three right. cavalry, I guess up until yeah. that point, yeah, up until that point, yeah, I'd, that I'd say so because the cavalry was away. The, the Sheridan was away from early, from late July until until late March. Yeah, Bruce. What shape was Wilson? Uh, Wilson's causes cavalry divisions when they started the raid. Were they relatively fresh? Were the horses relatively fresh? The Coutts' division was probably fresher than Wilson's division. Wilson had just been operating during the James River crossing, and he he 
asked for more time to get ready. So he needed a little bit more time to get ready than he expected. That's why the raid took had, had to wait until the 22nd to take off. But in that heat, it didn't really take much to run a run a horse to death. And they they one of the effects of the raid favorable to the federal side was they killed a lot of horse flesh in Southside Virginia. And another thing was that as they liberated slaves, they took the labor force away from the, the Southside Virginia. So, so there were damages to the horse flesh and to the labor, labor force. Yes, sir. You mentioned at the beginning that they had options which way they could go after. Was there a desired outcome? Like what was the one that they wanted? I think General Grant wanted them to burn Stanton River Bridge and go and join General Sherman. And, well, thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> One of the things I like when when John is uh, a speaker is and his research as well is is the strategy and tactics uh, side of of his research. And so you get a really, as you saw in the in, in the in the powerpoints here tonight in the maps, you get a really nice breakdown into the strategy and tactics uh, of the day to day. Uh, engagements of something as important as the Wilson Raid. So, everyone, uh, next month we will uh, reconvene uh, in October for Larry Hewitt, who's going to talk about the birth of combat photography. So, that's going to be a great uh, uh, meeting as well. Then in uh, November, we have Ken Masson Brown talking about the Gettysburg Retreat and what a magnificent book he has published uh, last year. And then our very own in December, uh, John Sebastian is going to be talking.